Hello and welcome to another one in our series of videos on the Scottish Wars of Independence. This video covers the years from 1314 to 1318 in the aftermath of Bruce's victory at the Battle of Bannockburn and focuses on the Scotland that Bruce was trying to build. Our aim in this video is to learn about how Bruce continued the war against England after the Battle of Bannockburn. And by the end of this video, we should be able to describe the key events of the war in Scotland between 1314 to 1318, be able to explain the short-term significance of Bruce's victory at Bannockburn, and likewise be able to explain the long-term after-effects of the conflict at Bannockburn to the ongoing war. Students of higher history are reminded to take notes of the information that appears in bold as we go through the video, and there will also be shown examples of questions from the higher paper that they may be able to apply their knowledge to. So to begin with a recap, why did the Scots win at the Battle of Bannockburn? To begin, Edward II had undermined his own chain of command. Commendable as it was, Edward II had wanted to show off his courage and his personal prowess at arms by fighting as an ordinary knight in the ranks of his army. However, this removed the focus of leadership from the head of his army. He instead gave leadership over to his nobles and he muddied the waters with this as well by confusing the men over who was actually in charge. The old system of command was still in place from the time of his father Edward I. So we have uh, seasoned nobles like the Earl of Hereford who are used to leading being replaced and overlooked by Edward II's younger and inexperienced favourites. This created situations in the battle where the men did not know where to look for command and where seasoned previous commanders, now replaced, questioned the orders of the replacements. This created chaos and confusion within the English ranks when it really came down to the fighting. And this uh, was unfortunately seen again and again during the two days of the battle. This served to really handicap the English efforts. On top of the weak chain of command, Edward arrogantly assumed that his march north from Falkirk would simply sweep the Scots aside. So in contrast with his failed campaign of 1310 to 1311, when he'd come into Lothian with an army of around about only five to 6,000 men, Edward was coming up towards Stirling with something in the region of perhaps as many 20,000 men. So riding high um, on this, this massive force, Edward, not for a minute, thought that Bruce would stand in front of him with his, his army of 6,000 men. This arrogance would be symptomatic of how the English regarded the Scots, really, during the two days of the battle. And it would trip them up again and again. An example of this is that the English did not learn from the failed cavalry charges from the first day of the battle. When De Boren led his cavalry charge towards the exposed Bruce um, as they appeared on the battlefield, um, Bruce's Shiltrum, his spearmen, emerged from the trees in the King's Park and crossed the field to support their king and drove off the cavalry charge of the English vanguard. This uh, series of events was repeated when Robert Clifford, uh, at the end of day one, also tried to ride past an Indian's Kirk, squeezing past Maury's Shiltrum to get through to Stirling. Maury's spearmen were successfully able to block a charge of English knights. Unfortunately, the English did not learn from these turnarounds on day one and began day two of the battle with a massed charge of knights against Bruce's spearmen, which also did not go well. During the battle, we can see as well, the English did not use their longbowmen effectively. Edward I had used the Welsh longbowmen in his army in 1298 to absolutely decimate William Wallace's ranks. However, at the Battle of Bannockburn, we can see that the English archers are squeezed to the, the periphery of the English ranks and only in the kind of later stages of day two of the battle are able to squeeze out and have the space to actually rain fire down on the Scottish ranks. And even then they were left exposed to Scottish cavalry who were able to, to ride in and sweep them aside. So we can see that English did not effectively use one of their most effective weapons which saw them suffer through day two of the battle. Now, just as Wallace and Murray at the Battle of Stirling Bridge in 1297, Bruce used the landscape effectively to his advantage. He created a situation where the English were left fighting hemmed in, unable to use their uh, vast superiority of numbers, squeezed in as they were within the confines of the Bannockburn and the Pale Stream. 
and Bruce also occupied drier, higher ground and fought downhill towards the English. Bruce's knowledge of the landscape played massively into his hands. Without that on his side, his army would have been surrounded and destroyed, just as Wallace's was at Falkirk in 1298. Finally, Bruce's commanders, unlike Edwards, knew the plan inside out. They become a well-oiled fighting machine over the years since Bruce's effective comeback in 1307. They knew the plan and they knew what to do. Bruce also, unlike the English, used his cavalry effectively. He did not use them simply to throw into the fray to add weight to numbers. He used them uh, tactically to remove threats such as the English archers or to cover any breaks that might come through his line. So overall, we can see that the Scots scored several victories tactically to basically hem in, contain the English and nullify their advantage in numbers. So students of higher history, or indeed even National Five History, may want to apply what they've learned from the previous videos on the Battle of Bannockburn to an exam type question. For example, here we can see an explain question. We should task them uh, with explaining why the Scottish Army were victorious at the Battle of Bannockburn. They would use the notes taken from the previous two videos, as well as the recap we just covered, to explain in detail why or how Bruce was able to carry off such a startling victory against superior numbers. So now we consider the question of what happened after the Battle of Bannockburn. What did it do to the political landscape, to the, the ongoing war between England and Scotland? Now the answer, before we really get into it, is that it did not bring about the end of the war. The wars of independence would rage on for yet another 14 years after Bruce's momentous victory. That aside, there were some... Um, quite weighty consequences that came out of the victory. So as we can see, the victory is going to be significant for several reasons. The battle was Scotland's most significant military victory over the English throughout the entire medieval period. Wallace's victory at Stirling Bridge had come as a shock to the English. Although it could be written off as a freak event, it was an ambush. It was a very specific set of events. The terrain had played into the Scottish side. Also, the English generals could be seen to have made some key tactical errors on day. The Battle of Bannockburn saw a field battle between two royal armies on an open battlefield. And even though massively outnumbering the Scots, and even though bringing far superior troops to the battle, the English army had lost. Bruce had won without the use of longbows, and he'd won without having heavy cavalry of his own. This went against the tenets, the key tenets of medieval warfare. This caused a shockwave across medieval Europe. So short term, the impact upon domestic Scottish politics was also huge. Scots had remained uncertain with the Bruce as their king and now became supporters. In fact, it's difficult to see how any of the Scottish nobles who'd remained loyal to the English cause up to this point could not have turned aside and come across the Bruce. They surely would have seen the way the wind was now blowing. Bruce had come off the back of a remarkable victory, he demonstrated the effectiveness of his army, he demonstrated the effectiveness of his own leadership, and he had sent a vastly superior English army packing. The question was as well, would Edward come back? Would Edward now press his claim uh, to Scotland, or was the war now moving into its end phase? So Scottish nobles who found themselves on the wrong side of the fence in the next few months would surely pay an extremely high price. So there was a rush of Scottish nobles who'd previously supported Edward, now declaring, unsurprisingly, their allegiance to the Bruce. His victory at Bannockburn legitimised his reign. No longer was he an upstart, a rebel, a pretender. Bruce was now a proven, effective leader, recognised by many as the real and legitimate King of Scotland. Edward had been soundly defeated north of the border with Bannockburn, and resistance to Bruce's rule in Scotland was now effectively over. As the cherry on the cake for Bruce, some of his most powerful enemies, such as John Common, son of John the Red Common, who Bruce had killed in Greyfriars Kirk in 1306, they were slain at Bannockburn, removing further thorns from his side. Scots also captured many important English gnolls at Bannockburn, 
some were ransomed for money. Humphrey de Bowen, the Earl of Hereford, was deemed so important that he was exchanged for 15 Scottish prisoners. And after seven years of captivity, as part of the exchange deal, Bruce got his wife, daughter and sister back, along with Bishop Wishop of Glasgow. Now this is massive for Bruce. We cannot overstate the importance of this turn of events. Barrackburn really, really did turn the course of Bruce's reign. So he's removed, as we saw, um, remaining thorns in his side, some pretenders to his throne. He has won back all the supporters, the Bishop Wishart, who was so fiery earlier on in the Wars of Independence and had been so useful to Bruce for his cause, um, promising absolution for him uh, for the murder of John Common um, after Bruce legged it up to Glasgow Cathedral um, after the, the murder back in 1306. The, uh, the bishop is old and blind now and of little actual use to the cause, but symbolically he was key. Um, the real thing for Bruce, though, is to get his family back. Now, he'd married Elizabeth de Burr, who was the daughter of uh, one of the earls of Ulster, and taken her as his queen. Um, he had not yet had children with her. She was his second wife. His first wife had produced his daughter, Marjorie, who'd also been taken by English. She was returned as well. She is Bruce's only surviving legitimate child at this time. Um, and he needs to get Elizabeth the bar back so obviously he can start the process of making a family. Bruce needs to have an eye to the succession. He does not want his family to fall into the problem that Alexander III's family fell into and restart this whole process if he is to solidify his claim on the, the throne of Scotland. To basically seal the deal, he needs to have an heir so that people recognise him as a legitimate king who is there to stay. At this stage, Bruce is 40, so the clock is ticking. His wife is also not in the first flush of youth. She's not old by any means, no. Um, she's in the kind of mid to later 20s. So he needs to, to get to, as it were, in terms of getting the family on the go. Um, the nobles that he captured at Bannockburn, uh, the English knights that were pulled from their horses and not killed but taken as hostage were excellent in terms of financial capital. Bruce could ransom these back to their families in England and he could use that ransom money to cover his debts from paying the price of raising an army and maintaining it in the field. And he could also use it to continue to pay for mercenaries to keep the war going. So Bannockburn offered Bruce a real bonanza of benefits and for his ongoing efforts to hold the throne. So with this in hand, Bruce can now set about restoring the royal succession and securing his position on the throne of Scotland. Now Bruce cemented his control over Scotland by holding another parliament in November 1314 at Cambus Kenneth Abbey near Stirling. The canvas Kenneth Abbey uh, sadly has mostly been destroyed, only the tower here still remains. Here, Bruce passed a new law. Scottish lords were now forbidden to hold lands in Scotland and England. Those who chose to keep their lands in England would see their Scottish lands and titles stripped from them. They would be disinherited. Bruce does not want split loyalties amongst the nobility of Scotland. This had been a problem um, for John Balliol. And it gives the English kings a tool to basically force Scottish nobles to betray their kings in Scotland, to come across the English side, and it creates questions. Bruce doesn't want those questions. So the parliament makes it illegal to hold lands in either camp. The lands of enemy Scots nobles were confiscated by Bruce, and they were shared out amongst Bruce's loyal noble supporters such as Thomas Randolph, who commanded one of the Shiltrams at uh, Barryburn, and James Douglas, one of the co-stars in Netflix's Outlaw King. Douglas would later become one of Bruce's most trusted lords in Scotland, one of his right-hand right -hand men, and one of his most formidable generals uh, in carrying the war to the English.
Panic Barn did not, however, mean an end to the War of Independence, as discussed earlier. For the English, its long-term effects were far less significant. The battle did not represent a significant defeat for the English military machine. It is a bump in the road. It is not the end of a chapter. It is not the end of the story. Edward II would have resolved to come back and have another go, and he had the resources to do so. England's economy was vibrant, and it was much larger than Scotland's. England had far more resources to replenish its losses than Scotland did, and this is going to be an uphill struggle for years to come for Bruce. The majority of England's nobles had either not travelled north with Edward's army, or they'd sent as few men as possible. Remember at this point, Edward II is still quite an unpopular monarch. He has obviously turned the tables from his disastrous attempt in 1310 and 1311 to raise an army and come to Scotland. And the army of Bannockburn was far, far larger, but he by no means has the unanimous backing of the nobility of England. So there's still a lot of um, fuel in the tank, as it were, when it comes to the English military machine. So... Because there was such a kind of non-committal uh, approach by the English lords to the host assembled the Bannockburn, this has limited the impact of the English losses on the wider kingdom. Of course, as well, Edward II himself had escaped the battlefield. The king lived on to fight another day and mount another campaign. So therefore, the fight goes on. After Bannockburn, the Bruce was unquestionably now the King of Scots. Few in Scotland would now stand against them. By August 1314, fighting was renewed. So two months after Bannockburn, Bruce launched several invasions into northern England, this time ravaging as far south as Yorkshire. In 1315, the Bruce launched an ambitious attempt to take over Cumbria for the Scots. His forces invaded across the border and they besieged Carlisle. Now, unlike the campaigns of Wallace in the aftermath of his victory at Stellenbridge, where he raided into Northumbria and into Cumbria as well, uh, the tail end of 1297, this is a serious attempt by the Scots. They built earthworks around the city to support siege engines to attack the walls. Now, mounting a siege is an expensive business to pay to keep your soldiers in place for so long and also the cost of constructing siege engines was not insignificant. But the Scottish army was still inexperienced at siege tactics, and Bruce was eventually forced to abandon his siege. He was not making headway. Carlisle was a fairly impressive and formidable border town Is spent years on the edge of war. So of any of the English cities, it is probably one of the best set, the best prepared to withstand a siege. So Bruce had picked a tough one to go to for a start. Um, and obviously he's taken the decision to relinquish the siege and fall back into Scotland. An army that stays in place in a siege in time becomes a target itself. If the wider kingdom that it's attacking can gather its resources and get its act together, then um, an army will know where to go to go and um, attack its foes. So Bruce would have been reticent to stay in the one place for too long lest Edward II got his act together and came after him. So from 1316 to 1318, Bruce uh, changed his tactics and his commanders launched a series of significant attacks into northern England. Their purpose would have been to, to raid, to gather resources, to plunder the towns and the villages of northern England. This would have helped pay for Bruce's armies and his mercenaries in the ongoing campaign. It would also have sowed the seeds of doubt amongst the English barons along the border. These barons paid taxes and dues to the crown of England, to Edward II, and part of that kind of contract between lord and king was that the king would come and protect the lord if a real threat came their way. And during the years 1316 to 1318, Edward II did not come to protect his northern barons. So if your king is not going to come and look out for you, the Northern Barons either need to take circumstances into their own hands or else they need to cut some form of deal with Bruce to end these attacks. So by doing that, Bruce is creating division amongst the English ranks. That's going to be one of his goals. 
In 1318, the war seemed to turn decisively in the Bruce's favour again as Scottish forces captured the last stronghold of English rule in Scotland. They took the city of Berwick. It was the last English outpost in Scotland and it finally fell after six failed attempts. Sir Robert Keith and Sir James Douglas took the city by stealth after slipping over the walls undetected. Bruce followed up his victory by invading into Northumbria and capturing land and castles as far south as Newcastle. The English border was under threat. The Scottish armies then took advantage of the situation, the fact that Edward II did not respond, and they raided as far south as Yorkshire. Edward seemed unable to protect Northern England. Local nobles and towns were forced to pay the Scots to stay away. So we can see Bruce has got himself into the situation where he can basically extract extortion money from these beleaguered English towns and cities of Northern England. Bruce would have been using this to pay for the ongoing war effort. So he is making up for his deficiency in resources compared to the, the vibrant economy of England by basically using plunder from England to pay for his war effort. Now this must must provoke Edward II into action. The reason Edward II isn't able to react at this point is he's still, still beset by unruly barons and he's trying to master control of his own kingdom before he can raise an army to come and deal with this rampant threat, it seems, of Bruce ranging across the northern reaches of his kingdom. So that's it for this video today. Thanks for listening, guys.